John Soros um, from Twitter. Uh, I'm actually from, I'm visiting too. I'm from the Montana office. Um, there's another one of us and you'll meet him later in the slides. Uh, he's an SRE for our mobile group. Um, but pants, I'm here to talk about pants. So um, this act kind of actually uh, segues well from the Mercurial talk. Um, pants is a build tool um, that was homegrown here at Twitter, kind of as an on the side thing. And um, it, um, it grew up out of wanting to be in the place that Facebook is, uh, or is go getting towards with um, a large monolithic repo, kind of for the reasons that were mentioned towards the end. Um, so where are we going? Um, talking a little bit about, um, a little bit more detail about why we wanted to get there, and then how Pants' build tool um, helps us be there, and in general helps with projects um, regardless of repo style or layout um, as well. Yeah, so let's talk about a little bit of history. Um, so just kind of upfront, uh, Pants is inspired from a tool called Blaze. So this photo is actually taken coming back from Facebook. We had a little summit for uh, a group of people that have worked on build tooling, including Facebook folks with their buck tool um, and some Mozilla folks um, at Facebook. And on the way home, we were behind this Blaze truck, which is awesome. So Blaze is Google's um, build tool that has a lot of technology behind it that helps handle monolithic repos well. Um, so a lot of the insp inspiration for uh, the tooling itself, that's where it came from, as well as for uh, you know, Buck and Facebook. Um, but credit where credit is due. So, um, so the other, the other uh, background behind wanting to do Pants was working, um, working with um, Ant in the past, but then more recently um, on a Maven project and running kind of the build for a team uh, using Maven. And Maven has this, um, you know, in the very name of the actual prime um, metadata that describes your Maven build, POM, the project object model, it's project focused. Um, and I was coming from a world where I much more wanted to focus um, builds on libraries, on small units. I wanted to encourage um, very fine grained granular um, pieces of code, well encapsulated. So project was just, is just was too big, too big a word. Um, it, there's more details than that, but that kind of gets to the gist of kind of the, the divide and uh, the directions the tools go. Uh, and we have a bunch of repos at Twitter. This is kind of a timeline of some of them, um, but in the time, in the major thing to take away from this is we were trying to converge repos together. Why? Um, well, there's there's a bunch of reasons. Uh, one of them is here, here's here's a here, this abuse repo over on the left. Um, God, that's hard to read. Um, the abuse repo over on the left, uh, it started out as an ant build. And this is the repo I started working on when I started at Twitter. And in that ant build, we had, um, we had a source tree that kind of looked like this. And so if you look at it, there's basically, there's a source branch. But you know, it, we, had, we had a repo where um, there were many projects in it, but there was one source tree. Um, and with an ant build, um, when things started out, this was a monolithic ant build. It was the simplest thing to do. And of course, the problem you get is your monolithic repo now produces monolithic artifacts. It breaks monolithically so that Joe Fred over here can break you even though you're working on totally different things. Um, too many downsides to mention. Nice. The only upside is there's only one dude that has to deal with a build because there's one build system. So people sort of like that until things break. So there's our source tree in 2010, and you can see that there's, um, there's Metastore trends. There were many, many more projects that kept it uh, kind of abbreviated to fit on the screen, but people just started, um, you know, they had the one build system, that build XML, Soros dealt with it, they didn't have to deal with it, they just kept adding code. Builds broke, things were slow. Um, so time to modularize, make things a little bit more like Maven, but not using Maven, um, and you have a build file per team. And so that makes things a little bit better, but people still need to learn Ant. Um, they don't want to do that. They just want to go on with their lives. And so we introduced the idea of build. So this right here um, is where Pants starts coming into the mix. Uh, what's going on there? Well, the, the idea there is um, you're going from describing projects to describing libraries. Um, you're basically pushing the metadata for uh, your build down to the smallest level possible in defining what your libraries are. Um, once you start doing that, 
And we'll see what a build file looks like a little bit later, but they're quite a bit easier to wrap your head around than an ant build file, um, or even potentially a pom, depending on if you're coming from it new or not. Uh, it's very easy to add new stuff to your build, to add a new library, link against it from another one, and what ends up happening, you end up getting lots of libraries. Um, it's easy to do, people glom onto this, and things start to grow. Uh, what we experienced was, oh, okay, let's add support for Python, and these concepts just tend to lead to your libraries kind of sprouting. So how do we do this? Um, well, so Pants starts fundamentally, it works on um, source trees. Any build system does this, right? Um, you have some source tree, you may have multiple source trees, depending on how you do your repo, and sometimes that's according to a convention of the build tool you use. Sometimes it's more customized. Jen's talked about acquisitions and the challenges um, that those bring because everybody's got a kind of different way of doing things. Um, so these source trees, you know, may be very indifferent. Um, this was kind of the particular system we had. So in Pants, um, you, you tell Pants about your source trees. Um, it doesn't have a convention. It knows about Maven, so it's a little bit easier to set up a Maven style project, um, but you basically can tell it, hey, this is, this is my tree, and what lives under there, these things called Java libraries and Java binaries, um, JVM binaries. We, we'll see that later, but it should sort of make sense what that means. And, um, and kind of as an aside, uh, this, this little DSL, source root, source Java, that behind the scenes is some Python code. It looks like this. So basically, in Pants, you'll see a lot of um, in these build files what look like function calls, and they're actually all constructors, and they're constructing Python objects. And there's where you get pants, it's Python ant. So it's basically a Python um, replacement of our ant build system, and initially, in fact, it, um, uh, pants ran uh, for 30 milliseconds up front, kicked out hundreds of build XML files, and then invoked ant in a recursive build. It's now finally gutted all of that ant off the back end, but the name remains. So source trees. So we also do some uh, do a bunch of Python coding at Twitter, and so we have a source tree also for Python. So you, again, we can just, in our repo, say, hey, we got some code that's gonna live here, and what type of code? Python libraries, Python binaries. And so, um, so that describes the shape of your repo, right? That describes uh, kind of where your basic units live. Then there's the actual job of saying, um, of dividing up that source tree, of basically telling Pants, the build system, uh, which, which units of code are actually logical library units. And these are basically paths in your repo, right? Uh, both in Java and Python, Scala, um, these libraries tend to be grouped into um, a directory structure. So a particular leaf directory probably represents um, a unit of library. Sometimes they're coarser, but in general this is true. And so these paths in the, in the tree, these form what are called targets in pants. So targets kind of replace the palm. So the palm describes this whole big project. In pants you describe lots of little targets. Effectively a target's a library. And so these targets, those, these um, paths in the source tree, the way you specify them is with an address, and that address looks like a file system path for the most part. You see source, Python, Twitter, pants. But then there's this build colon pants dash lib. So basically you've got this two part address where it's the path to a build file and then the name of um, a definition which we'll see inside that build file. Because you can have many. You could basically have a build file that owns you know, this source Python Twitter pants directory and it might define three libraries and carve up that directory these three files form this library, this one file forms this library, and the rest form the other. So there's multiple different ways to spell an address to a target. What do these targets look like? When you drop into a target, you kind of this is where you're defining your library. So um, before, when we were defining source roots, um, the source Java source root accepted Java libraries and JVM binaries, if you remember. And a Java library, that's all it looks like. Give the thing a name, so you've got a kind of a, a unit that you can refer to, and tell Pants what it owns. Um, these concepts kind of uh, map over to the different languages it supports. Right now it supports Java, Scala, and Python. Um, and so you have similar constructs for each. There's a Scala library as well. 
And then you know, the, next, the next bit about coding is you have these libraries, and these libraries have dependencies. You want to reuse kind of some core functionality amongst uh, the products um, that it makes sense to reuse it. And so you have dependency links between these things. And the build system, of course, needs to know about these to be able to know the correct order to build things in or what total set of things to build um, to actually get linkage. And so you have these dependency links in your source tree right now. Um, you may glob over them, so they may only be, so here, you know, th this is what happened before build files were introduced and we just had the ant build. Or depending on how you use palms, if you're not that disciplined, because you have a project, it tends to be, to divide off a new project means writing a new palm and a new 15 folder directory structure that you need to plop down on disk. And so you might be tempted, instead of breaking out a library because you have to do all that work, um, you might be tempted to just smash a library that could have been common right in your project in the directory structure. And the palm, for example, would just build all that as one project, one artifact. Um, but hopefully, though, you're not doing that, at least in your code, logically, in your code um, has small self-contained APIs that depend on each other, even if they're all getting built at once. So Pants is going to try to encourage you to not only have that logical boundary, but have the physical boundary um, physical by actually defining these small targets and linking them. So that looks like this. You add a dependencies clause. So here we have the Java library referring to another Java library. And this is where those addresses come in. So this address basically says um, this quantity library that d deals with like dimensions and units, let's have that point off to base. It's going to get some core functionality there. So, um, you know, just like the Jenkins job DSL, the idea is, I mean, this is Python code, code, but hopefully it's, um, even if you're not a Python person, it's sort of obvious what the things mean. It sort of reads logically. And so as you do this, you can link up, you know, um, a lot of internal libraries, but then at the end of the day, there's always going to be something out there that you need that someone else has done. Um, Facebook wrote some great library, you want to link it in, LinkedIn, you know, you need to link these in, and so you actually have to have <laughs> dependencies um, for external artifacts. Um, and so these kind of look a little different in spelling, but they go in the same place, and you can kind of say, oh, I'm going to depend on Guava. And then you have the same constructs that map over for you know, Python as well. In Python, you have eggs that might be remote, and you can depend on those. Things look slightly different, but basically the same shape. You've got a library. It's globbing some Python sources. It's got some internal dependencies and some external ones. So that's how you tell Pants. Um, that's what you end up writing as a developer. Not as a Pants developer, but just as a day-to-day -day developer. You write those build files. You um, define the unit of library that you just hacked on, and um, people can start linking to it. So then what do you do with these? Um, so this is, uh, this, is one, this is Scott. This is our, uh, our mobile operator, our SRE Scott. He's the other Montana fellow, so that's what that photo is. Just wanted to say hi, Scott. He's not in town this week. So operators, what do, you, what do you do with these? So, so those targets are the nouns. So a nice way to think about pants as a build system is it's got nouns and it's got verbs. And so the verbs are you know, what you want to do. I want to compile something. I want to test it. I want to generate the Java doc. Um, all kinds of different things you might want to do. So um, on the command line, those are called goals. So as an artifact of history right now, you have to actually write the word goal. That will eventually go away. Um, and there's, you know, there's metadata goes as well, goals as well. You can list the targets in the repo, you can list dependency mappings, you can list what targets own what files, um, but you need to tell Pants what the verb is that you want to do. I want to list. Some of the verbs need to operate on some nouns. So like Pants goal list, that doesn't need to operate on any nouns. If you say Pants goal list and you don't tell it anything more, it, prob you know, it can guess, oh, okay, you need to list all the targets in the repository. Um, however, most, most of the verbs take um, some portion of the repo you want to work on. So this is how, this is how even though uh, if you do use pants and you don't have to, in a monolithic context in a, in a repo, you can tell it exactly what you want to work on so that it can just work on what you need. So in this case, we say restrict the listing to um, this target, to source Python Twitter common, and the colon colon is just a recursive glob. So all the targets underneath that directory. And then a lot of the verbs also, you can modify their behavior with command line flags. Um, so in this case, we're doing a dash H. 
we're going to get uh, the help text for the list goal and the different options you can pass to list. But that's the anatomy of a command line in pants. This is the verb where you tell it how to run. Um, and these things can be intermixed in any, in any random way. And they can, and they can also be mul multiple. Um, we'll get into quickly about, uh, well, I won't, I won't talk about flags. So these verbs, um, we talked about the targets, and the targets themselves have uh, dependencies. Your libraries have dependencies on other libraries. Well, the goals that you run, um, they also have dependencies as well. So like if I want to compile code, I probably have to first resolve some of those external dependencies, fetch some jars maybe, um, or at least assemble a class path. Um, and then I might have to generate some code. Let's say we use thrift or protobuf or some technology like that, we might have to generate some code. And then finally, we might have to take that class path and we might have to take that generated code in our existing code and now finally compile them. So obviously, you know, compile has a dependency on, genera on code generation and it also has a dependency on um, resolving external artifacts. So that forms a graph as well. And this is a, a little pants command line where we're saying dash E, we're saying explain. And so it's kind of explaining what a compile um, does and the compile depends on all these things. So this, this is kind of a list of the internal goals that Pant's going to run for you to end up achieving a compile. So here's a, here's a representation of what kind of what we just talked about a little bit simpler. This would be uh, the test goal. It depends on you know, compiling the actual test and the code that the uh, test uh, test and also depends on resolving jars. And, um, and, and of course, that dependency, you know, things in pants will, will run in the reverse order. We'll start, we'll, we'll collapse the graph from the other end, and we'll first do our resolution, and then we'll compile, and then we'll test. Um, and, and this is the basic operation, this is the basic mechanism of the operation of the build tool, is you have dependencies between these goals, and you just execute these, um, you just execute these goals in order to satisfy on up the stream. Kind of done behind the scenes for you. Um, and uh, an important point is that um, pants is batch in both the universe that you want to operate on, basically the set of targets, and in the goals you want to perform on that universe. And so here's an example command line where there are actually three goals. Clean all is a goal. Horrible goal. You should never have, your build tool should never need to clean all, but pants still does. Um, and then test and bundle. And so uh, test is hopefully obvious. It's going to try to run Python tests. Um, Scala specs, JUnit tests, it's gonna to try to do those sorts of things. Bundle will generate kind of a zip archive of your project and any extra loose files it needs. But we're telling it to do two different, three different things and to two different sets of targets. You see there's a first set, which is a bunch of tests, actually with a, with a recursive glob, so it's everything found underneath there. Um, and then there's some source code that points off to a main. Um, so we've clearly got a mix of tests and source code. Uh, and then we also, there's a flag. So we're telling, it looks like we're probably telling bundle that we want a, 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 TG, a, a tar gz. So the command line is batch. You can, you can tell it to do a lot of different operations. And what will and what'll pants do? Well, it'll take that target graph that you've identified. So all those targets that you identified, identify an internal target graph. Um, so you may have only specified T1 in the command line, but T1 implies via the dependency links, all these other targets. So it's got this universe of nouns to operate on, the source code um, that you care about, your repo being a much larger set, presumably. And then it's got this graph of goals that you specified, maybe only by specifying test, but implying you know, compile and, and resolve. And then it starts walking through in reverse, goal by goal. And each goal in, in, in the batch nature means that each, each goal operates on the targets that make sense uh, for it to operate on. So in this case, you see resolve is only operating on um, target one, L1, and L2. L3 it's not. And presumably that's because L3, let's say, is a Java library that only depends on the core uh, Java um, APIs. So it has no external dependencies, so there's nothing to fetch. But this guy may depend on Guava, this guy um, may also depend on Guava, and this one may you know, depend on Finagle. And so the resolve step is going to need to fetch um, the jars for those three. So resolve only operates on that subset of the graph. And then you go to compile, and presumably compile needs to act on all of these. 
So it compiles the test target, the two library, and the three library targets. And then we get to test, and test only operates on the test target. So in this way, you can tell, you can basically give pants a universe of targets that may all um, have different treatment in a universe of goals, but each, each goal will operate on the subset it needs to. One other important thing to mention is that, um, and this is kind of getting into the details of how it works, but uh, behind the scenes, pants is effectively on the target side. So we've got the two graphs, right? We've got the verb graph, which you tend not to care about as a developer, it just happens. And you get the noun graph that you author in your build files with your targets. And as this graph, um, as these goals are operating, they effectively transform that target graph. Uh, the Java compile task takes, um, it takes Java source code. So it takes a node, it takes a library that owns Java source code, and it kicks out on the other side a library that owns class files. There's obviously a correspondence. So as, as, you, as you process each phase, you're going to um, have these targets in memory that are kind of getting generated and the graph gets mutated step by step. And here we've got an example of, I added in a gen, which we talked about, a gen goal. And you can imagine when the gen goal operates, it might operate on a thrift target, that's T1. And that thrift target might define uh, a thrift library that's got two files. One file with a bunch of structs and another file that defines a service. Um, and so when that operates, it's going to generate something. It might generate Python code, it might generate Scala code, it might generate Java code. Um, let's, let's pretend it's, it's generating Python code. So uh, gen runs, it takes in T1 as an input, and it kicks out T1 prime, and T1 prime is actually a Python library. And it's a Python library that owns, um, it's as if you would have authored a, a Python library in a build file, except that it's kind of this ephemeral thing that just got generated by um, the goal itself. That node gets stitched into the graph, and we work on downstream to the next um, goal in the pipeline. So the spirit of the thing behind the scenes is this kind of uh, target graph transformation engine, with each goal doing its part to transform for the next one. So at its heart, um, we've got this, uh, in, in pants, you've got this uh, you know, set of libraries and targets um, that you define as a developer, and you do this in build files. Um, Effectively, you're presented with a DSL, but in reality, build files are Python. This is a strength and a weakness in Pants right now. Um, it's a strength because it's very easy to add, um, to use Python, the programming language, to add structure to your build files if you need to do something odd. Um, so one of the speakers um, prior talked about, uh, Jens talked about always being behind, which I hadn't thought of it that way, but it's tr really true. Like, as providing these tools, you're always going to be behind what developers need to do, because you can't guess uh, everything they need to do. So it's nice, um, so actually having the build files be um, evaluated Python is nice from, the pers nice from the perspective that a developer um, that knows a little bit of Python can probably get themselves out of a situation where the tool doesn't directly support what they need right now. There's obviously a bad side of this also allows um, a lot of uncontrolled growth uh, to occur. So there's good and bad there. But at its heart, Pants is in Python. Um, and also, um, another side to this is since Pants is in Python, an odd thing about Pants is it grew up um, as a Java build tool. Um, it's written in Python, but most of the work it needs to do is in Java. And so um, one, of, one of the problems you have is in one of the goals that I had for this tool was for it to be very, very fast. Um, our build times were slow in the past, and so now I've got this barrier, right, because you choose Python as your actual coding language for the tool, but you actually need to do a bunch of stuff with Java tools because that's one of your main targets, Java and Scala. And so you've got this problem of like JVM startup overhead. You can imagine you're compiling all these targets. If you shell out to a JVM for each call, uh, that's really, really slow. And in fact, the old ant build effectively did this. Um, and so, uh, so one of the key, um, one of the key components uh, of pants to make it fast for those target um, languages, which are important for uh, Twitter, um, is to actually not have to have the overhead of invoking a JVM to do jarring or, uh, well, Java docs a bad example, uh, Java compiles, re resolving 
jars, those sorts of things. And so we used, so we used Nailgun behind the scenes. And Nailgun is a tool that basically just gives you a persistent Java daemon that you can keep up and running and talk to over a socket, which we do natively from Python. So this is used throughout Pants pervasively on the JVM side. So this is one of the tools that we use. Um, and that keeps invocation overhead really low. Uh, so that, that allows us to actually gain build speed back, keep caches hot um, in the JVM, keep classes loaded. Uh, we use Zinc for uh, compiling Scala code, and that um, has those advantages plus more of actually caching compilers and doing some extra invalidation logic um, at the level of Scala code that Pants doesn't know about. Same thing on the Java side with JMake, um, which is probably a little known product. We ended up finding out about it from uh, Bob Lee at Square. They had a build tool they didn't open source that was based on Blaze too. Um, but they use JMake. So we, we managed to keep performance uh, pretty nice by using this combination of persistent Java daemons and incremental compilers that know about the languages they compile. Um, and some quick things before we go into, well, I guess I only got the five. Um, so right now, the status of the build tool is it's, uh, it's been open source since May of like two, 2011. Um, but it's been open sourced in a repo that dog foods the mono repo concept. So it's kind of hidden. Um, it doesn't have press, doesn't have a logo, and it doesn't have a name. So if you go out to GitHub under Twitter, there's this commons repo, which sounds really generic. And if you actually look inside it, it's got Scala code, Java code, and Python. And it's also got pants. And so this is basically a subsection of one of our large mono repos at Twitter, sliced out and open sourced and it happens to host within it Pants. And right now, Pants, um, so you can use Pants pretty much only in that Twitter Commons repo. Um, it's, it's, got, uh, it's got a good sizable portion of configuration that lives outside the tool itself, and so it's, you basically can't use it as an outsider right now today. It's too hard. So this year, um, one of the things we're doing this first quarter is working hard at getting this to be more modular so people can use it um, easily. We do have other companies using it, but in each case that I'm aware of, it was somebody who used to work at Twitter that went to a different company um, and also worked at Google in the past, and they wanted a, a build tool like this. So Foursquare has been using, Foursquare has fully converted over to it <coughs> for their monolithic Scala repo, um, but they had an engineer from Twitter um, you know, that knew what was up. So, uh, so he contributes a lot, but he also knew how to set it up. Um, and then there's this Urban Compass in New York uses it, but they also had an engineer here who knew about it, and so they could set it up. But otherwise, it's, it's pretty hard to do. So what we're going to be doing is moving from Twitter Commons, uh, we're going to break pants, we're going to break with the monorepo concept and break the pants code out on its own um, to its own repo, just to make it easier for people to contribute, uh, make it easier on ourselves, because right now we're juggling uh, a bunch of repos, um, and that should be happening uh, you know, in this first quarter this year. Yeah. And uh, before I open it up for questions, one thing I want to do is just thank the major contributors and just put their names up there. Uh, Wickman will be giving a talk tomorrow night at a Python meetup. Um, he's another engineer at Twitter, and he's done the vast majority of um, the development of the back end to handle Python libraries, binaries, um, fetching eggs, that sort of thing. Um, and and that, actually, that portion is actually really interesting because Pants uses itself to build itself using that tooling. Um, Benji, Benji was the fellow at, Benji's the fellow at Foursquare, Benji Weinberger, um, who's done a massive amount of contribution on the Scala side, including, mm, <coughs> including a lot of contributions to uh, TypeSafe and the actual SPT incremental compiler, the Zinc incremental compiler, uh, making that better. And then Mark, um, Mark Chu Carroll, hopefully you've bought his book, Good Math. Um, he did a lot of work while he was at Foursquare on uh, Pants as well as part of their migration effort. And he's now with us working on a different team. And then DevProd, um, we actually have a team now, which is awesome. This started off uh, as a side project, and now we have a bunch of DevProd people working hard on the, uh, on the actual tool, hopefully to get it so some of you folks can use it. So I'll end it uh, there and not go to the tail slides. Um, does anybody have any questions about the, about the tool? 
Um, the question was, do you deal with Blaze, uh, Blaze's concept of golden so you don't just deal with what's in head in the repo? When I was there, there was no such thing, so I'm not sure what that means. So, um, so what is golden? So we don't. <laughs> Um, you cannot do that today. Um, the only way you can do it is we didn't get into there. Are, there, are, there are a lot of other ways that you can customize a library, and one of them is to say that you provide um, an artifact, and that's effectively how you say I publish a jar. Um, and so, the only way you can pin back in time is depend on is to depend on source code that's in the repo, but via its published jar that's some snapshot in time. We highly, highly discourage that. Um, just because it can make things very confusing to reason about, and it makes uh, it's very difficult to deal with the dependencies, but it's it's not first class for the concept you talked about, right? So the question was, when when a developer uses um, pants at Twitter to build their, you know, whatever they're building, um, do they do that on their local machine or do they farm it out? So they do it on their local machine, um, but we're moving right now. So one of the big contributions from Foursquare was Pants internally, like I didn't really talk about what it does, but it uses content hashes for those libraries to know when it needs to rebuild things. Um, so Pants is dumb about all languages except Python, but it's smart about knowing this fine grained library's content hash has changed. So I need to do something. Um, and, and so that cache um, was local as of a year ago, but then Foursquare took the interface and broke it out so there's now a remote cache with an HTTP interface, it's pretty simple. And so, although Pants doesn't um, have a built-in facility for remote building right now, it does have a built-in facility for remote cache. And actually this ends up, that's even actually a bigger deal than having a remote build because it, as it turns out by the numbers, it depends on your organization and how you develop, what your developers hack on, but it's probably the case um, that the core library that you use or the 18 of them that you use were already built by somebody else at the content hash that you have on your disk, depending on the rate of change of stuff in your repo. Um, so with a remote cache um, in play, Pants, as Pants figures out, okay, I need to build this graph, it'll check, the, it'll check, the local ca it'll check this cache abstraction and it won't know it's getting some of them from remote, but it might satisfy 75% of your dependencies from this cache. Um, yeah, so that's the only built-in facility it has right now. It has no built-in facility for remote building. Internally at Twitter, um, you know, we've got some CI systems and we've got this iron tool that, you know, it's not open sourced that are working towards that end on the build side. Um, but yeah, that's, that's not there. Well, thank you.